this week on the Backtable podcast. We had one user, we were doing like a running clinic, like a weekend, where we basically teach amputees uh, how to do sports again and to run again and use the prosthetic properly. And we had one young father, he had a two-year-old daughter who just learned how to uh, walk and run. And he, all of a sudden, he started crying and he was like, Georgia, you can't imagine like what it actually means to me right now. Because for the first time when I came, come home after this weekend, I can run and catch my daughter when she's running uh, away from me, like laughing. And I think it's really these moments that are like so special and so motivating. Welcome to Backtable Innovation. You can find all our previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and at backtable.com. This is the next installment of Backtable Innovation, where we will learn from physicians and entrepreneurs working hard to drive healthcare forward. My name's Deanna and I'll be your host this week. I'm a physician and biomedical engineer in London, joining Backtable to bring more European voices to the show. On today's episode, we'll be welcoming Georgia Nader, the Vice President of Futuring and Business Transition at Otterbock. Otterbock's at the forefront of innovation for human mobility, and I'm super excited to learn more. So Georgia, great to have you on the show. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Perfect. Let's start like this. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be on the show. My name is Georgia. Otterbock, which is the company name, was actually also my great-grandfather who founded the company in 1919, so right after the First World War. So it's our family business in the third and fourth generation. I'm the fourth generation with my sister. And yeah, and my father actually led the business for over 30 years and I grew up around the business. was always like very, very involved with the business. And I always joke and say I already have 26 years of Otterbock experience. <laughs> <laughs> which is quite accurate because I think I spent all my time after school in the business with employees, with users, with our product and our fabrication halls. And um, when I was studying, I was also in the board uh, for six years of the company. And after I finished my MBA last summer, I said, okay, I really want to be more operational, more involved in the daily business of the company, which I also was before, just without an official role. Yeah, so since last summer or um, I'm actually located in France and um, we are basically currently looking at the current organizational setup, the market and what we need to change to get ready for the future and basically prepare the generational change on different levels. So it's really exciting right now. Awesome. So can you tell us a little bit more about Otterbot? What is it that you guys build? Yeah, so maybe I can just walk you through the history a little bit. So the company was actually, like I said, founded after the First World War because there were so many people who were injured and came back in like with need of prosthetics. So they lost their arms, they lost their legs. Obviously a very traumatic time for many, many people. And back then, because the need was so big, my great-grandfather founded a startup back then in Berlin. And we started with the fabrication of components. And due to political unrest in Berlin at the time, we then relocated the company in the same year to his hometown, which was in a different state of the country. And the company grew quite big back then already. It grew to 600 employees within 30 years. Then, unfortunately, we lost everything when the company got taken away in times when Germany was occupied. And we basically had to start from zero. So back then, my great-grandfather had two daughters and my grandmother's husband, he took over the business because he was also involved in the business already before and they fell in love and then he took it over back then and they built everything up from zero basically with a number of motivated employees back then. Then quite early for these times in the 1950s, my great-grandfather actually started the internationalization of the company. So he opened the first subsidiary in the US in Minneapolis and he was also really like an inventor. He was also educated as a prosthetist. And then basically we started doing big innovations for the time. And one of the first ones was the Yupani, which for the first time featured a brake mechanism and a high level of stance stability for the amputees. So help me understand, during this time you had all these people that came back having traumatic amputations and what your grandparents did was make prosthetics for them essentially. Exactly. That's basically what they did. I, did, I missed the name. What's it called? The Yam, the Yami? The Yupani. <laughs> it's a knee joint. The Yupani. Yeah, the Yupani. Awesome. Tell me more about the Yupani. Yeah, so it basically featured for the first time like a brake mechanism. So it wasn't moving freely all the time. And it had a high level of stand stability. So you didn't have to basically rely on your own balance all the time. You didn't have to focus all the time on the knee joint. Basically, the prosthesis was helping you do that. 
And another breakthrough innovation back then was the myoelectric arm prosthesis to talk a bit about the upper limb innovations. The real benefit back then was that people for the first time could grasp light and also fragile objects, so be very careful while moving the hand, but also heavy items. So it was way more suitable for everyday life because obviously there's different like situations where you have to grasp and lift different objects. And it uses like electric voltages to control the processes. And that's also where the name comes from, because every contraction basically of the limb that's still there produces muscle action currents, which then are basically then in return used to control the signals for the artificial hand. Nice. And is that the same technology that's in place today? Um, yeah, actually, it's still used, obviously, uh, more advanced now, as there were a lot of product updates and more innovations basically on top of it. But at the base, it's still used today. So this year, it's actually 104 years of mobility for people. And Autobock was always kind of a very human-centric story and company. So basically, coming to our mission is to really empower people to live the life that they want to live after a big event in their life, like an accident or an illness after losing their limb or having a really bad traumatic experience in their life and basically living their life with all the freedom of movement they want, with all the safety and also the confidence. That's awesome. So Otterbock focuses mainly on prosthetics, but I, when I was doing research, I realized you do a lot of work in orthotics and neuromobility. Can you help our listeners understand a little bit about the difference between the three? Yeah, the difference is actually quite easy. So Basically, prosthetics replace a limb. So if you lose your arm or your leg, you basically get an artificial limb that's replacing this one. And orthotics basically help with the mobility of limbs that are still there. Uh, so for example, if you have a neurological disease or basically as a support or if you had an injury, and I think a lot of us know these, I don't know if you ever had a sports injury and you, you need a, I don't know, knee support or something that's very basic forms of orthotics. And then we moved more and more into neuromobility. We can also talk about later a bit more in detail, but it's basically targeting more neurological diseases. So MS or CP or post polio and trying really to build solutions around that. Is the main focus mainly on the prosthetics business or is it sort of across the three? I would say across three. It also depends a little bit on the market. So we have big innovations in all of these, in all of the product category domains. Yeah, exactly. Which one has been most challenging to innovate in? That's a really difficult question. <laughs> I think <laughs> they all have their different challenges. I think we came from prosthetics. So that was for us actually always the natural thing to go on with, right? And develop more and more and move deeper into the innovations. But then orthotics was basically a natural progression of that. And I think neuromobility is really the newest addition to the portfolio because we said we already also do wheelchairs, we do neuroorthotics. How can we use our expertise to move into other fields where we can help more people? So it really sounds like Otterbock has been at the forefront of developing innovations in the space. I'd love to walk through a little bit more. So what's most popular now? What are the most popular products today? It's really hard to choose from, I would say, because there's obviously so many exciting projects in the pipeline and some of them I can't talk about yet. So maybe we have to do another episode. For sure. One of our breakthrough innovations just had its 25th birthday, actually, which is the C-Leg and was the first microprocessor controlled knee joint in the industry. Yeah, and many of the features that are like super important in everyday life that you never really think about when you, I don't know, do your movements and activities during your normal day. But that are really important if you basically think about features of a knee joint. For example, walking backwards, every door you open, you have to take a step backwards before you open it, right? You never really think about it, but it's such an important feature a prosthesis has to have. Or walking the stairs, stepping over obstacles. So basically, it really was from the start adapting to a much wider variety of like everyday situations. You said microprocessor knee. What do you mean by that? Does it have software and built into it? It has, yeah. It basically locates you like in what position the knee stands. And then based on that, helps you to move, to go over obstacles and stuff like that. Yeah, so in general, I would say there's a more natural and intuitive walking with microprocessor knees. And to today, we had more than 100,000 fittings around the globe, actually, with a C-leg. Wow. 
And it really opened up the market back then for these kinds of solutions. It was the first microprocessor knee and yeah, it was a really, really big revolution of the market back then, basically. That's awesome. Yeah, I've never really considered that you need to walk backwards to open a door, you know? And I do it every day. Exactly. You never think about it. It's quite interesting. But now you will always think about it, I can tell you. And maybe <laughs> um, about a few of my favorites right now. One of them I'm actually also working on in France is the Exapods Molly suit. It's basically a neurostimulation suit, talking about neuromobility again. Um, and it's really for patients with spastic intense muscles or weak muscle activation and pain related to that. The stimulation basically can be, can be personalized on 58 electrodes based on the patient's symptoms. So what, like muscles, can he move more freely? Where does he have spasticity? What kind of patients would this be indicated in? So the main populations where we can so far and uh, see huge successes are MS patients, so multiple sclerosis and CP, so cerebral palsy patients. And then basically the suit has to be personalized to the patient and then it has to be worn uh, every day for one hour. It's basically the stimulation period and then where it works for patients where it works and we can see that it's really different. Some have like medium results, some have really strong results, um, but they can benefit the whole day. And like I said, MS and CP are the main patient groups where it works really well. And it's a very simple and non-invasive and drug-free way to reduce plasticity and pain. So the essentially the simulation, the stimulation of the of the muscles helps just provide symptom relief at the moment. Is that the main use case? Yeah. But right now we're also looking with neurologists to see what else is happening actually that we that we didn't see it. So and the neurological functions. And we're currently doing studies around it to also understand like what patient group is the best fit to make sure that we have good results. And then another one of my favorites, there are so many, is our new quick change adapter, which is basically an adapter that connects the knee joint with the socket. So the socket is basically where the limb that is still there is placed in. People usually, I don't know if they are above knee amputees, they have a everyday knee joint that they wear in their everyday life. And then sometimes they also have a bathing prosthesis and some also have like a running blade if they want to do sports. But usually you always have to see a certified clinician if you want to change from your everyday knee to your running blade. So it's super, super inconvenient. And if you really want to do a lot of sports, it's just like not feasible, right? So with the new adapter, you can basically yourself for the first time switch your knee joint um, and it's super safe and wow. fast and convenient. And So you've never been able to do that in the past. So a typical patient with a prosthetic limb would have a fixed limb for a certain period of time. Yeah, exactly. And they obviously can take off the socket, but usually they are not allowed to change the adapter by themselves. But now it's really within seconds, you can, you can quickly do it yourself at home. And I mean, if you think about you want to spontaneously go running, right? Like you can't do that. And it's, I think it's such a big change. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. That helps you have sort of that flexibility in your day-to-day -day life. So you can change your activities, participate in sport and do what you need to do in your everyday life. I didn't realize that you were unable to change them without an adapt. Yeah, it's quite interesting. It's yeah. like so inconvenient, right? And if you, you usually, if you think about it when you do sports, you just take your running shoes and go for a run. And if you always have to plan it a few days ahead to get an appointment, it's just not nice. Why have previous prosthetic limbs not allowed you to, why aren't you allowed to change them independently? Is it around sort of risk of falls and concerns around, you know, incorrect fittings? Or is it just fundamentally ha the product design? I think it's a big safety aspect, right? I think many people probably do it themselves. I think they wouldn't have issues because they know <laughs> how it works. But it's mainly a safety aspect, doing the right alignment, making sure it's really safe and they really put it to the end, you know. Great. So thanks for talking us through your favorite innovations at Autobot. Talked a lot about the microprocessor knee, the neurosimulation suit, and that awesome adapter. It sounds like you've moved from product-centric innovation to more user-centric innovation. So sort of from thinking more about the prosthesis with the earlier innovations that you described to thinking more about the user and what the requirements are in your day-to-day -day life. Can you talk me through what that process is a bit more? Yeah, of course. Like you probably already thought earlier, we were always a very product-focused company with focused on a lot of tech and a lot of innovation, you know, like German engineering and perfectionists. <laughs> Everything needed to be safe and the highest quality. And that's obviously the stereotype lives on. But obviously, like, if you want to become more user-centric, obviously this still has to be in place, right? But there's also different things that we need to pay attention to. And I think there's really like three points that are 
like the main focus for us that are really, really important in this transition from this product centric company to really a user centric company. And I think the first one is that we have to be very insight driven. So really, really understand the user before acting. And like I said, I think earlier we often came from the engineering standpoint, like what features do the engineers think are like good for the users, right? But now also really thinking about what do the users really want from our products? Like what are their daily needs and challenges and what functions do they really care about? Because we often had functions that were then in real life, like rarely used because it was just like <laughs> a bit over-engineered. Can you give me some examples of those? When did you fall into that trap? Yeah, I'm always t talking to one user who's a good friend of mine. And he's actually always complaining about half the people like, can't even use these features. Why do we even have to put them in there? And he's very active. So he's always like, I'm very active and I'm using a lot of features. But if I'm even not using them, maybe we should just talk to the users and be like, okay, what do you really need and want? And what should we put more emphasis and like focus on? So I think we do that in many, many ways now. And one of them is we actually set up a patient community, which is called Movao. This is basically a synonym for Move as One. And this really gives like a safe space for users to interact, to exchange. And we can basically just be there and listen. It's not a branded community. It's just for them. They can connect, they can talk, they can find people close to them that have the same hobbies. They can also give feedback on products. And we can just listen and see like, what do they actually like? What do they not like? Usually they are very open about it and we can then use that as inspiration for new innovations. And it's kind of like a small market research platform actually for us. And we can then use these inside outs on our communication and campaigns and really challenge the products and ideas with the user. And then also on that, I think you have to re have to be really conversational. So I think we used to do a lot of one way conversation, like from us to the user, from us to the clinician, from us to the customer. But I think it's really about also offering the opportunity for dialogue. So before it was us doing the talking, the educating, the presenting. But now, obviously, through the internet, patients have so much more information themselves. They exchange via social media. They have questions, demands, and it's many more channels that these conversations are going on, right? Much more of a dialogue. Exactly. And it's not only a customer care hotline where this is happening. Tell me more. Tell me, how, what, how do you collaborate with physicians, with therapists um, to address these needs and challenges? I think it's really important to get them involved early and really also have a dialogue with all of them and work closely together, right? So for us, just to get some of the words straight that I use all the time, so for us, users or patients, right? And we just don't like to call them users that much because often they had an accident, I don't know, 20 years ago and they are long out of the hospital and they don't see themselves as patients anymore. So we usually say users. And then we have our customers, which is basically the patient care clinics that we sell our products to. And then for us clinicians is a certified prosthetist and orthotist, which is basically a CPO. So for us clinicians, if we talk about it, are mainly CPOs as we produce the components and the products. Or oh, we used to do that. We also moved into other fields now, but they basically finalize the work with the patient and personalize the product composition to the body of the patient, to the indication, to the personal like lifestyle and resulting needs. So I think for us, it's really a lot about informing and educating about products and the fitting of the because right now obviously there are a lot of products out there right and for example for the knee joints that we already talked about earlier there are mechanical ones there are microprocessor ones then you have a free few different manufacturers per manufacturer then you have a few different products in each of these categories so it's really like difficult if you don't know the benefits and the products in detail like to decide what's actually best for the patient, as it depends a lot on the amputation level, the lifestyle, the activities, and the needs in their everyday life. So you work a lot with the clinicians in this case to sort of educate them, educate them on what the limitations and indications are of each prosthetic. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's mainly about product benefits and what product fits what need best and what mobility grade and like what lifestyle. But I think it's also really important for us to involve them early to get feedback from them, right? Like, what is the feedback from the patient? What did they like? What did they not like? What would they actually want from the product in their everyday life and activities? And also in terms of the actual fitting process that they are doing, like, was it easy to do it for them? Was it easy to do the alignment of the prosthesis? Was the setup clear? And how was the outcome of the fitting? Do you ever get them working sort of directly with engineers and development engineers? Or is this a process that happens separately? I think for us, in terms of 
involving them in innovation, there's really two ways to do that, right? Just because we then saw that this feedback and this communication directly with the patient that the clinicians have is so important to us, we basically decided to move into patient care ourselves. And we now have more than 400 clinics all over the world and a lot of the clinicians in the network. For us, this really is like a really, really, really important way to look at new innovations, right? Trying to involve them into the innovation process. We have like calls every now and then where we do regional calls within like patient care clinics and the network or like global calls. We have them involved very closely with our R&D team. And they also innovate themselves and already did before we bought them. So now I think it's really just so nice for them too, because we have the sales engine, we have the we can scale things way quicker and we have the production in place too. So I think as a component manufacturer combined with these service providers, it's just a great fit because they can bring in their feedback and their ideas and we can basically scale it and bring it to our network and then bring it back to also other clinics. So I think it's such a, I don't know, I really loved the teamwork that we did so far with our clinics on innovation. So it sounds like there's definitely a dialogue between the distributing these prosthetics and finding sort of new needs to meet. And then secondly, I think that's one topic that's very close to my heart about involving also users more into the innovation process. Because obviously we also involve them via the patient care clinics, right? But I think we also need to listen to them much better and earlier in the process of development. Because usually back then we basically developed a product until it was ready to launch and then we got the user's feedback in, which is obviously way too late if you really still want to change something, right? So now, obviously, we have a lot of users in our network and many of our ambassadors also became very close friends of mine over the years. And they are usually always like super outspoken about what we can do better. They know exactly what they want and they don't hold back, let's say, like this. They experience it every day. They know exactly what they want and what they need and they don't need an engineer or me telling them how to live their life and what their pain points are every day. Help me understand, how do you turn those pain points into something that an engineer can understand? So again, as I mentioned, like a lot of our listeners are physicians who can identify these unmet needs similar to the pain points that you describe that users identify. How do you turn that into something that an engineer can action? Usually by just bringing them together very simply and having a conversation about it. Because I think that was really what was lacking before. But now we have certain like processes, how to do that. And we have one like format, which we call Spotlight, where we basically invite the yeah, product management team and some people from R&D and then a lot of users and they just talk. They can ask questions. They can basically talk about what they really don't like about other products, what they really enjoy with others and what they would want from a product that they would use in their everyday life. And I joined many, many of these sessions last year and it was so, so great to see, to have these conversations and really talk about the things that are really important to them. And like I said, they really don't hold back. So <laughs> it's usually quite clear what they want. <laughs> they give you honest feedback. Very honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about the process of innovation and how you gather those insights and make sure that it's something that an engineer can build. But being a global company, it must be really hard to make sure that the right patient finds the right product. How do Autobook address this? Um, yeah, I think I already talked a lot about our own clinics, where we not only sell Autobook products, but also other products from competitors, because we really want to give the patient a fitting of the product that best suits their needs. That can also be a competitor. They also sell our products. So I think it's really like different things, right? I think first of all, it's really about making sure that the patient has access to the product. And that's where a lot of work goes in from our side, especially with these very new innovation, like the microprocessor needs that we talked about earlier, which is like an innovation that the market hasn't seen before, right? So there's obviously also no reimbursement for it. So we have a market access team that's doing a lot of work on this. But what really, like what's market access for us? It's basically about enabling patients access to the technology via institutional reimbursement. So via health insurances, private insurances, because when we really want patients to benefit from our technologies, we need to make sure there's channels to access those. So we do that through creating clinical evidence, which is always an important topic. So... Basically, right now, there's two main pillars there that we focus on. First of all, on these microprocessor needs that we talked about earlier. 
And there we focus a lot on K2 mobility grade. So it's basically amputees who can walk slowly with their prosthesis, who can manage like small environmental obstacles like curbs, single steps, or also like uneven surfaces. But the amount and time and the distance they can walk are quite limited by their condition. You would think that microprocessors are more for active users. That was always kind of the thing that was said in the market, right? But now we could really show for the first time that patients with lower mobility could really like benefit from this product because they have a, a reduced number of falls, reduction of the anxiety of falling, which is also really important too. Which is huge, right? It is huge. That's that's what that's what really affects your day to day living. It really does, and I mean, it's like always watching every step you do, right? You really don't have your head free to do anything else or to focus on anything else or. It's like the difference between going on a hike with flip-flops exactly. versus, you know, hiking boots. Exactly. Yeah, it, it was quite nice. Like one patient once said that finally can hear the birds again because he could, for the first time after a long time, could focus on his surroundings instead of just the next step he's taking, right? So we could really see a reduction of this anxiety of falling too and a reduction in the risk of falling. So really everything concerning the safety of this patient group, which when you think about that's often like not very mobile patients or older patients. This is really important. And what's really interesting is that 50% of this K2 mobility group who tried the product moved to a higher mobility grade after using it and when going to the reassessment. So, which means they basically could walk more and faster. And yeah, that for me was really, really interesting. And then um, I think... So it sounds like one of the big challenges that Autobot has to face is sort of this clinical evidence generation strategy. So what is it? Like, how is it that you can make sure that more patients get access to these new emerging technologies as and when they become ready for market use, right? Exactly. I think it's really through these studies and fighting for reimbursement for the patients, right? And really us making the work that the products get reimbursed and that they have access to it. And I'm curious, do you guys do any work to sort of address prosthetic access to prosthetics sort of in low middle income countries yeah so we have subsidiaries in 63 countries and we're present in more than 100 countries through customers or distribution systems so we're really present around the globe right and obviously every healthcare system is <laughs> different i mean i'm now in france that has a very different uh, healthcare system than germany already and they're right next door. And they are right next door. And still it's different. And so obviously there's a lot of work that needs to be done with every like payer and every healthcare system. But I think through these clinical studies and really providing this evidence, it makes it easier for us to have these conversations in every country, I would say. And maybe talking about the second pillar of our like focus in the market access team. It's really on these breakthrough innovations. One of them I already mentioned earlier, which is our Exoparts Modi suit, the neurostimulation suit. We're currently doing a lot of studies and I'm really excited about the outcomes. I'm really curious how it will look like. Um, but now in France, we're doing a lot of trials and the product's not reimbursed yet. Obviously, it's hard for people to come up with a few thousand euros by themselves all of a sudden to afford the product. So. I think it's really so critical, especially if I see the results of these fittings, to fight for the reimbursement for them and to do the work for the patients so they don't have to. And often they can't do it alone, right? So we really put an effort in to do this and also support patients with basically... And is that that's like working with societies, with insurance companies, with physicians, with healthcare providers to make sure that everything's in place? Basically, yeah. So... Yeah great thing in healthcare is there's a lot of different stakeholders <laughs> and it's different in every country right um, so hard to know which one which one you should please yeah but the good thing is we often like i said we are present in many countries and obviously the subsidiaries in the market and the people there know their system very well and they also have the relationships that's what we're doing since uh, many many years fighting for the reimbursement for our products that's really awesome just thinking about the future, can you help our listeners understand what are the key developments in the industry of mobility care? Like, what have they been in the last decade? So one of them is actually, for example, the digitalization of the fabrication and the fitting in the patient care clinics, right? Because it used to be a real craftsmanship and it still is. We used to use like plaster cast to create the socket for the stump all by hand. And today we move more and more into scanning and 3D printing of 
products and components, right? And I think probably many, many people know the dentist example. I was actually there last week and I had to get a print of my teeth to get a retainer fixed. And they just scanned it and it was so convenient. It took like 20 seconds. And if I look back a few years, it was <laughs> not very nice if you had to do that because you had to use this, I don't know. Put that gel well, inside your mouth. The worst, <laughs> right? The worst. So I think you can compare it a little bit to that because we can scan now too and we can print. And it's first of all, it attracts talents to the industry, right? Um, young people want to work digitally. They don't want to work with like yeah, materials that are, I don't know, a mess and everywhere and that don't smell nice. And it's obviously also much more convenient for the patient and much faster. I think another topic that we already talked about a bit too is that focus and the move into normability which is basically for us the focus on neurological indications, which is from our side supported by some innovations like the C-brace or the Expert Molly suit. But for us, this really is like a new patient population that have very different needs and very different patient journeys. But it's also a new group of clinicians that we have to involve, right? We all of a sudden work with neurologists that were, we were not really in contact with before in our field of prosthetics and orthotics, maybe a little bit in neuroorthotics for the C-brace, for example. But otherwise, not really. So I think now it's really about, first of all, building the right innovations for these patients, but first understanding their needs better in their everyday life and also really educating like the stakeholders about the new products and opening up these new channels. And then again, looking or fighting for reimbursement. And I guess it's also a challenge to sort of deliver that interdisciplinary care. Never an easy feat. And Georgia, how do you stay up to date with all the latest tech and mobility care? How does this fit into sort of your vision of what Otterbock will be in the future? I think for us, it's really like a combination between leveraging our patient care network that are obviously in direct contact with the patients. They talk to them every day. They hear their evolving needs and the questions they have every day. And like I already mentioned, there's a lot of innovation coming from that. So I love to visit clinics and just stay there for the day and join fittings. And I think I always say that I learn more there than, I don't know, in three weeks talking about the product, right? So, for example, I joined the tour when we did the first Exports Molly suit fittings in France now. And it was so emotional. I cried a few times, I have to say. Yeah, we had one woman. She was a psychologist. She couldn't really write anymore. And her hands were shaking all the time. And after the stimulation of an hour, um, she could write again. And she was like, just like, while she was writing, she was... That gives me goosebumps. Yeah, it always gives me goosebumps too. And I really, I cry all the time. <laughs> it's <laughs> embarrassing. But yeah, she could write again and she just write it, I want, I want. She was getting like faster and bigger and it was just so emotional. And she started crying, her husband started crying. And so I really love to do that. And there's so much knowledge coming from that. And then also talking to the patients and listening to their needs. And we also have a few empathies in our R&D team. And I think that's it's amazing. And I also love talking to them. And like I said, they don't hold back with their wants and needs and what they think is a stupid idea and what they think is a great idea. So they're, they're engineers themselves. Yeah, actually, um, one friend of mine, he's, he used to be a Paralympic athlete. He's actually the inventor of the quick change adapter that I talked about earlier. So after he retired from sports, he joined us. He's like a big brother for me. And he actually just sent me a video yesterday of his daughter, who was two years old, changing his knee joint with a quick change adapter. Just shows human facts engineering on another level. It really does. No, but I think it's great to have them involved in, in the process too. And then I think for us, it's also really important to be very close to hospitals and research centers and universities. And we really have a big network there that we are in close contact to. And our R&D team is constantly like talking to. And we're obviously also looking for new opportunities and uh, directions where research is going. So, Georgia, I, I want to hear more about you as well. I know that, you know, this is a family business. You have 26 years of experience right from the very start. But w what inspires you to work in the healthcare space? I'd love to hear more about your journey through this. I really grew up around the company, right? I spent probably more time in the company after school than, I don't know, doing anything else. For me, it was really, it wasn't clear from the start. Obviously, I think as a child, you have many ideas what you want to do when you're, <laughs> when you're older. But I think for me, it was really being close to our users and hearing their stories and hearing like how we can positively influence their life every day and what it actually means for them like to be able to go back to work to be able to stand up out of a wheelchair and walk again to run again to do sports again for example we had 
one user we were doing like a running clinic like weekend where we basically teach amputees uh, how to do sports again and to run again and use the prosthetic properly and we had one young father he had a two-year-old daughter who just learned how to uh, walk and run and he all of a sudden he started crying and he was like georgia you can't imagine like what it actually means to me right now because for the first time when i can come home after this weekend i can run and catch my daughter when she's running uh, away from me like laughing and i think it's really these moments that are like so special and so motivating and shape the next steps and be involved and be close to the users and see these moments and really I know a lot of our listeners are interventional radiologists that work very closely with vascular surgeons and in they're in the business of limb salvage. And it's really incredible to hear from you and hear about Otterbock and learn more about the things that we can do to address limb loss in a meaningful way so that people can continue to, you know, open doors and step over curbs and chase their two-year-old children. So thank you very much, Georgia. It's been such a pleasure to learn more about Otterbock. Just before we finish up, where can our listeners learn more about Otterbock and mobility care. If they were interested in reaching out, what's the best way to get in touch with you? I think there are different ways. So first of all, I think you can find everything on our website, uh, otterbock.com. There's all the information for clinicians, for SCBOs, for yeah, patients, for users. Yeah, everything you can find there, basically. And I think another great way to also look at what we do in our daily business and to see the products live on our users is to visit our Instagram page, which is just Otterbock. And I think there we really try to let our users tell their stories on their own. So tell about the product, their life with the product, what it did, um, how it helped them in their everyday life how it affected their family life, their work life, just really tell their story. And I think that's really like powerful. And we use a lot of user-generated content. So I think if you want to know what we do, I think that's yeah super interesting and super uh, nice to look at. And I always love going there and just watching users. That's awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with? No, I think from my side, that's it. But thank you so much for having me. And it was a lot of fun to talk to you. Well, thank you very much, Georgia. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Backtable Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable Innovation is produced and hosted by Brian Hartley, Aaron Fritz, Diana Velasquez Pimentel, and Eric Yamaker. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Willie Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.